Hey everyone, this is Bathmetrics, and today I'm going to be talking about how to set something called the recording offset for your audio interface in Bitwig. And this is kind of in the vein of my Ableton versus Bitwig videos because Ableton makes this real easy, but it also behaves differently in Ableton than it does in Bitwig. And uh, this is just something that can be confusing if you've never really figured out what all this stuff means. Now, what makes this video challenging is I can't demonstrate this live for you in real time because to set the recording offset for my audio interface, I would have to be in an ASIO driver mode using my, my actual uh, ID14 interface from Audient. And I can't record OBS videos with ASIO turned on <laughs> because OBS just doesn't really handle ASIO input at all. So whenever I record these videos, I have to flip Bitwig into the Wasapi driver for Windows. That's the only way I can actually record my mic and the audio coming out of my DAW at the same time. So this one's going to be a little different in that when I get to the part where I show you the walkthrough of actually doing this, I'm going to play a video that I made that doesn't have any sound in it and no narration. And I'm going to try and sort of narrate in real time over it <laughs> while the video plays. So we'll see how this goes. Uh, at any rate, the point of this is that when you have an audio interface, uh, let me just open up the mixer here. So I use an ID14 from Audient. And every audio interface has a uh, buffer size setting that you have to set, and also, of course, a sample rate setting. And modern audio interfaces are supposed to report their latency to the DAW so that the DAW knows how to compensate for how long it takes the signal to come in through the interface and then go into the DAW and so that it records things in a way that's time-aligned with the things that might be playing back in your DAW. So for example, if you're recording vocals and your DAW is playing a drum beat, you want your vocals to line up in sync to be quantized, well not quantized, but just in sync with the drum beat, right? But it's just the nature of things that there's a little bit of lag or delay or latency in terms of getting the vocal coming in through your mic and then your audio interface and into the track on your DAW, there's some latency there. And so the vocals tend to be late unless you do some special adjustment. So modern, modern audio interfaces report their latency as they understand it, right? But there's some things that can happen inside your system that create further latency between the actual audio latency reported by the DAW, okay? So there's always this, this question of uh, what kind of extra compensation or offset do you need to add to what the audio interface is reporting? By default in Bitwig, it's zero samples because Bitwig has no idea. Um, and so we need to set this. And the video is going to show you this in real time. And I'll talk a little bit over the video while we're doing it. Now to set up for this test, um, there's a couple things you have to be aware of and a couple gotchas. So let me describe those before I start playing back the video. We're going to end up with something that looks like this. This is kind of the end result of what the video is showing you. And the first thing I want to point out is that, well, actually, before I even do all that, to, to do this type of recording test, I have a click track that I created that's in this first track here called Click Block. And then I temporarily disconnected the, the one of the outputs going into one of my monitors. Okay, so the cable from the output on my audio interface, I took the left speaker cable out and I plugged that into the right input of my audio interface. So I'm creating an analog loopback. And what that's doing is it's letting me play this click source, which gets sent out of Bitwig. And then it was going over here to this audio track, which is set to um, pull in from, well, I don't have audio inputs to find here, but over on my ASIO card, I have an audio input that's configured to, gosh, will it even show up here? No, of course not. 
see if I flip to ASIO, you'll stop hearing my voice so I can't narrate. But just, just to be clear, I have an input over here, a mono input for one of the channels on my audio card, the right channel. So my mic is normally plugged into my right channel, and it's going to a mono input. And that input has a name that's called mic input, right? And so you're going to have something like that set up. And what you want to do is take, you know, either the left or right output of your DAW, which is hearing this stereo click track, and you want to plug that cable into the input of your audio interface that you're going to use for vocal recording or guitar recording or, or bass recording or whatever, any kind of analog instrument that you're recording. Uh, plug that cable back into it so you have this loop back from your cable from the output directly back to one of your inputs, okay? And then over here, you're going to be in the video, you'll see I'm setting up another track and turning on the uh, record enable, which I can't do right now because there's no, there's no input for it. But you'll see the input here says mic input or something like that. And, um, you know, so then when you play this and you have record enabled up here in the transport and you, you just play back, it's going to automatically record the same exact thing that's coming out of this clip. But there's going to be a little bit of a delay or lag to it, right? And that's, that's the trick is you then visually line these up and figure out what your recording offsets should be to get rid of that delay. So that's what you're going to be seeing. Now, some of the gotchas and the way to do this is one thing you have to be aware of is in Bitwig 3.0 they introduced, or maybe it was 3.01, they introduced up here in your timeline ruler, they introduced this thing called a real-time ruler. And you're going to want this turned on. And I'm just going to briefly show this to you. This shows you the number of minutes and seconds, right? So this is zero, this is the first second, the second second, the third second, and so on. So these are seconds that you're seeing here. And I'm going to zoom in on the, the one second mark. And as I zoom in far enough, you're going to see that we get these tick marks now that say 100, 200, 300, 400, 500, and so on, all the way up to 900, just before it rolls around to the first second again. And then it starts over again, 100, 200. So these numbers after the decimal point are milliseconds, right? So if I zoom in even further around this one second mark, you're going to see that we now have 900 milliseconds, 910 milliseconds, 920 milliseconds, 930, and so on, all the way up to 990, just before the zero one. And if I zoom in even farther, you're going to see that now it's 991, 992, 993, and so on. And these are milliseconds, right? If I zoom in even further, all the way up, we can see now that we have decimal points on the milliseconds. So this is 999 milliseconds, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, and so on and so forth, all the way up to 0 0.9, and then it rolls around to one whole second. Okay, so this timeline ruler is going to be very useful in helping us do this testing, because we're going to count up the number of milliseconds of lag or delay we have in this second sample compared to the first sample and use that as a starting point for setting our recording offset. So then the next gotcha is some people might do this test once, calculate the number of milliseconds or samples, however they can figure out how to do it, right? There's a couple ways to do it, but using this time ruler is the easiest way to do it. And then they'll plug in that value like 1.8 milliseconds. And then they think they're done, but you're not done because that's just kind of, you know, when you use some tool to measure how many samples or milliseconds the delay is, you kind of have to do it a few times and maybe adjust that initial value back and forth by one or two samples in either direction and, and run the test a few times to get things lined up. So you're going to see me do that in the videos. I don't just do it set at once. I first calculate milliseconds. And then I come in here and I do the recording a couple more times and I nudge this up or down by like one or two milliseconds until I get them to line up perfectly. Okay, the next gotcha, there's another thing you have to think about here. This kind of test and this kind of offset value that you set is only accurate at the specific buffer size you do the test at. 
Okay, so here's your dilemma. You have to ask yourself, usually when I'm going to record vocals or I'm going to record guitar or bass, what sample, what buffer size, I'm sorry, what buffer size is my project at, right? Because as you start having a fully loaded project with lots of synthesizers and VSTs and, you know, processing VSTs, things that incur latency, um, you know, like linear phase EQs and stuff, the more stuff you add that has latency and just the more stuff you have in general, the bigger your buffer size has to be or you run out of CPU, right? So for me, early on in a project, when I have like four or five synths and samplers and drum machines going, I'm usually already up at like the 512 buffer size, 512 samples. Um, Later on in a project, when I'm in mix down and mastering and I've got all my really heavy mastering plugins in place, I'm up to like the 200, 2048 buffer size, right? So I almost never work at 128 buffer size, except when I'm recording, because a 512 sample buffer size at a 441 sample rate is going to be about 11 and a half milliseconds of latency just right off the bat. And that can be too long for tracking vocals, right? I mean, humans start perceiving the latency sort of like ping. They start perceiving it at about 20 milliseconds. Some people might be sensitive to even lower latency amounts. So when you set your, your buffer size to something more like 128 samples, your your latency now is about two and a half milliseconds or thereabouts, which is really fast. It's almost nothing. And so that allows you to record your vocals into the DAW and maybe even have some low latency effects on the vocal track, like reverb and um, you know some things that you like for vocal ambiance while you're tracking to make your voice sound better. Uh, you can put some low latency stuff on that track and have only like two or three milliseconds of latency. And so your, your vocal timing will be really close to whatever sounds are coming out of the DAW that you're tracking against, right? And you don't even have to use the low latency monitoring features of your audio interface, which are usually dry, unless you have a, a really expensive interface like a, a UAD Apollo which has plugins right on the interface that can, you know, make for really nice vocal tracking effects with zero latency whatsoever. Most of us using uh, lower priced interfaces than an Apollo, you know, we're stuck if we want to have reverb or something during tracking, we have to do it in the DAW. So that means we can't use the hardware zero latency monitoring, right? Okay, so <laughs> hopefully you're following all this. The point is decide what buffer size you're always going to use for recording and do this test at that buffer size. So what you can see over here is I'm doing this test at 128 samples because that's the buffer size I use when I'm doing vocal tracking. That gives me a good low latency, even though I'm using DAW plugin devices for my vocal tracking. Okay. So you have to set this, and when, when you're working at other latencies later on in the project lifecycle, the value you set here won't change, but it won't be accurate. It'll actually be slightly off, so just keep that in mind. Now, a third got you is people get, gotcha, is people get confused a little bit by this recording offset. This only applies to things that you, analog sounds that you're recording through your audio interface vocals through a microphone, direct injection, guitars, and basses. It does not apply to any kind of soft synth inside your DAW, right? So if you have a soft synth like Serum and you're playing MIDI notes and you're recording those MIDI notes, this, this value has nothing to do with any of that. This is audio only and only audio coming in through your audio interface. Now, if you have hardware synthesizers, external hardware synths, you control that in a totally different way than this recording offset. This, this is like a baseline, but then you have to do a further kind of latency compensation using something Bitwig calls the hardware instrument. And let me show you that real quick. 
This is the Bitwig hardware instrument. Uh, if you want to find it, it's in the set of Bitwig devices, and it's this one right here called HW Instrument, right? So that's this device right here. And this is basically a router that sends the MIDI output from whatever clips might be on this track. Like if I added a, a clip right here and I started putting some MIDI in this clip, it's going to send the MIDI from this clip out to the hardware instrument in this top section. And then it's going to capture the returning audio. And it's basically, this is like putting serum or, or phase plant or massive or uh, a bitwig instrument like polysynth or, or FM4 or something. This is just an instrument, but it's doing some routing to send the MIDI correctly out to the external synth. And then it's also doing some latency compensation on the returning signal so that everything's lined up so that when you play a MIDI note, the audio that comes back is precisely lined up with that MIDI note, okay? And here's where you pick, like, on your audio interface, which of those inputs on the audio interface are bringing the signal back from the hardware instrument, okay? And it, 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 the thing I want to point out is that this field down here is where you set your delay compensation, and you use this button to do a special little test that just automatically does some system level pinging of the hardware interface and then sets this round trip latency accordingly. You don't have to manually set this. You literally just like point this at the right synth here and then say, you know, where's my audio input coming in? And then once you've got all that set up, you click this button and it's going to set this latency value for you. And it's going to be correct if and only if you have first correctly set up your recording offset using the test I'm going to show you in this video, where you have this analog loop back and you're playing a click track and recording that click track as it's being played out of the DAW. So you have to have this set up first. This is the baseline. And if this is set up correctly, then and only then will this ping test actually compensate correctly for the round trip to a specific hardware device. So this is the other thing people get a little confused about because in Ableton, it's different, right? Um, in Bitwig, they make it really clear and laid out if you understand how this hardware instrument works. Okay, what else? What else? Some other gotchas. Uh, yeah, this is a really important one too. The first thing you're going to see me do in the video is make this special track for the click source. This is one contiguous audio event. This whole thing is one eight bar audio event full of a bunch of clicks, but it didn't start out that way. And it can be tempting to just find a, a, a click sound from somewhere in your sample library, right? So I had one of these was my click sound. I can't remember which one, it was probably this one. And it can be tempting to just drag this in, right? and then do something like select a little chunk of time like I did, and then control D, 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 right? And just duplicate it out and then say, let me use that for my test. Don't do that because this will create a little bit of jitter. Um, even if you were to take all these things and like select the group of them and then do control J to consolidate them into one clip, it looks like a clip. If you look at it under the covers, here, where are you? Click hipsters. Come on. Oh, for fuck's sake. Ah, that's right, because I'm in this multi-edit mode. Um, let me turn this off. Okay. Come on. Oh. All right. Turn you off. Now it'll work. Turn you off. Come on. Oh. Sometimes this this thing is annoying. All right, we'll just do it by looking at the clip. So here's the clip, but you'll see that it's a whole bunch of different individual audio events or samples, right? In Bitwig, there's this notion of clips on the track level are a container for multiple potentially different samples, and that allows us to do some really cool and interesting audio editing that you can't do in Ableton, but it's confusing at first, right? The point, though, is every one of these samples is like 
Bitwig has to think about them a little bit. When it comes across a new sample, it's got to like trigger it and fire it and get it into the audio stream and do a bunch of things. And so there's just a tiny, teeny bit of very small jitter that can happen when you have a clip that looks like this. So one of the things you're going to see me do in the sample right off the bat is first I consolidate all of them into a clip like this, and then I do bounce in place to just turn this into one contiguous audio event. Now it's a single sample. So when Bitwig comes across this sample and starts playing it, it's just one sample. It loads the whole thing into memory and then plays it, and so the timing is perfect and there's no jitter between these individual audio events. And so then they're just 100% perfectly on grid every single time. So you're gonna see me do that quickly at the beginning of the video to create this thing. And just be aware, it's two steps. Consolidate, then bounce in place, make it a single audio event under the covers, and this is the type of clip you wanna test. Okay, so with all those things out of the way, I'm gonna play the video now and just kind of maybe talk a little bit over it to, to show you what's happening during the video. All right, so here in the first part, I'm uh, just showing the timeline ruler, how to turn it on. As I zoom in, uh, I'm showing that it shows actual millisecond values. And by the way, I, I did this in part like this with all this dragging around because I've answered some questions internally in my producer forums by showing them this silent video and adding some text, but I finally decided to just turn this into a narrated video. So here I found a single click, dragged it in, I'm gonna dupe it out to about eight bars. And yes, I could dupe this faster, but once I get going, I just finish it. <laughs> All right, then I'm going to select all those and consolidate it into one clip. Then I right click and bounce in place. That makes it one contiguous sample instead of a bunch of 20 or 30 different samples inside of a clip. Okay. And then uh, we make sure that this track is armed. You can see it's coming in through uh, an input channel. And it's as simple as, you know, you, you double check, make sure you're getting your audio from the loopback circuit that you created with your cable. I'm showing that I did this at a buffer size of 128. That's my typical buffer size for recording. You can also kind of see there my input bus is correctly defined for the ASIO driver. Okay. And then uh, we just record, record it out to a full eight bars. And the reason this is useful to record a long section like this is about 15 seconds at this project tempo. By recording something long like this, you can double check that, you know, the gap you're seeing at the end of the track is pretty much identical to the gap you're seeing at the beginning of the track or clip rather. So then I take uh, any one point and I start zooming in on it. Uh, I also, because uh, the recorded sample wasn't as loud as the original, I kicked it up by 10 dB to make them look pretty much the same. And so now you can see the lag. This is, this is the actual lag caused by my system after the lag that's reported by my audio interface. And so I'm looking at the, the tick numbers up here and I'm calculating like 95.3 or four minus 93 point whatever, is roughly 1.9 milliseconds, right? You just subtract those two values, put it in as milliseconds, be sure and specify MS so that it plops itself in as milliseconds, and then Bitwig converts that to the samples. So again, it's whatever that value is, 95 point something minus whatever that value is, 93 point something, right? And I came up with 1.9, and it's just a starting point. We're gonna iterate now. So then you delete the clip and do it all over again. Just re-record it now that you put in a 1.9 millisecond recording offset. And then we're gonna, you know, once this is done, we're gonna zoom in and check it at a couple points and see if they're lined up yet.
Okay, so we're going in near the start of the clip. It's kind of lined up, but not quite yet. I'm not going to increase the gain again just to make them look very similar and make it easier to find things. So you can see the second recorded clip is a little early now. It's not late, it's early. So I went too far with the number of samples of recording offset. 84 is too many, so I'm going to drop it down to 83. And then we're going to try again. And you drop it, or 82 in this case, so you drop it down by left clicking on it and then dragging up or down and do it on the sample number. So we just delete it, record it again. I usually find like if you're close to the mark with your initial millisecond measurement, then it's usually one or two or three samples in either direction that you have to tweak and adjust it slightly. Okay, so again, we're going to check near the beginning of the clip, check one of those. And again, I got to make the clip louder, 10 dB of gain. All right. That's looking pretty close. Let's see, we zoom all the way in and oh, they're like right on the money, okay? You can't ask for better. Now we're gonna go zoom out and look towards the end of the track and see if we're getting similar results out there, which we should be, right? And sure enough, again, they're lined up perfectly, okay? So 82 samples is obviously the perfect recording offset for my interface on my system at a buffer size of 128 and a sample rate of 44.1, right? So I've perfectly set that. And now again here for, you know, the sake of my friends that I was showing the silent version of this and doing some extra narration, I'm just explaining what I did a little minute, uh, a little while ago about the hardware instrument. Once that recording offset is correctly set, you can use that button right there to ping your synth and set the latency for you. Now I don't use any hardware synths, but that's how it works. Um, and then uh, you pretty much want to do that every single time you have a new project and you bring a hardware synth into it. You want to make sure you just run that little ping test real quick and just set up your synth for that track in that project at that time, at whatever um, sample rate you're working at. And then you can pretty much count that uh, whatever you record on the hardware instrument is going to be accurate in terms of timing. Now, the last thing to know is that, you know, when you set up a hardware instrument like this, this is um, a MIDI clip, right? If I, if I go in here, this is MIDI. So I put some notes, right? It's a MIDI clip. How do you turn this into flattened audio and have that audio be time aligned accurately, right? I've seen people talk about like, well, I'm gonna set up a new audio track with control shift T, and then I'm gonna set this track's properties to record its input from the hardware instrument output. Okay, yes, you could do that, but you're just introducing extra variables you don't need to. Uh, it's a lot simpler to simply, now in this case, it'll be an empty clip because I don't actually have a hardware instrument, but why not just right click on the clip and say bounce? Right, bounce prefader 32 bit. And if you do that, you're going to get a perfect audio clip right on time. And you haven't had to get rid of the original MIDI clip. Okay, so that's the trick for flattening out hardware instruments to audio is just bounce. That's what bounce is for. And then, of course, because Bitwig's awesome, you can simply deactivate this track. Uh, I have a shortcut key to do it, but you can do it with uh, right here, this thing. My shortcut key is zero, like Ableton. Um, and if you deactivate the track, uh, there's this handy button right here that'll hide it from the project and it's gone, right? Doesn't bother you. Here's your bounced audio, your flattened audio. And if you ever need to get back and redo it, you can simply click this button, re-enable this track, reactivate it, uh, get rid of your old bounce, right? Bounce it again. And then uh, if you have audio processing and stuff set up on the original track, you can just drag this clip down here, delete this now empty track, and you're back to where you were. And then you can deactivate this again and hide all your deactivated tracks one more time by clicking this X button. So that's pretty much your workflow. Hope this has been helpful, and I'll see you next time.